so your patient is a 17 year old woman 22 weeks right she is presenting with nausea vomiting and abdominal pain and a pain start in the middle of the abdomen now located along her mid to right side she is noted to have a temperature as well she denies any past history and what is that we want to talk about it here now let's look at this uh i'm sure from the clinical situation you know that we are dealing with acute appendicitis and acute appendicitis is the most common surgical problem in pregnancy right and the answer here is d the incidence is unchanged in pregnancy as compared to non pregnant states but i want you to look at the other options and understand why they are incorrect and then you could have do, done it by uh, exclusion okay so owing to the anatomical and physiological changes diagnosis is easier to make no this is a false statement in fact for appendicitis the diagnosis is more difficult to make because of the general physiological changes because you know leukocytosis is more common in pregnancy uh, gi symptoms can be more common in pregnancy right so not only this the location of the pain can be different especially if you talk about third trimester uh instead of the pain going on to the mcburney's point or the right lower quadrant it could be in the right middle sometimes in the upper quadrant as well because of the gravid uterus pushing the appendix right so diagnosis is actually more difficult to make then a uh, surgical treatment should be delayed since the patient is pregnant absolutely no in fact if you delay the treatment there will be adverse outcomes for both the mother and the fetus fetal outcome is improved with delayed diagnosis no that's what we said you could uh, you know uh, deal with a ruptured appendix and the fetal outcome will be poorer if you delay the diagnosis and the treatment right and uh, the investigation of choice remains as ultrasound so if you see the diameter to be more than or equal to 6 mm so uh, uh, a tubular structure then you know that this is acute appendicitis that's how we make a diagnosis a close dd for acute appendicitis would be round ligament pain but what you have to understand from this is that round ligament pain is generally not progressive in nature okay acute appendicitis is progressive in nature uh, the round ligament pain is usually not associated with fever or nausea or vomiting and this pain is you know aggravated by movement and relieved by rest okay and also relieved by applying hot pads so these things do not go in favor of or uh, appendicitis so th that's a common uh, dd for acute appendicitis another dd would be ectopic especially if appendicitis happens early in pregnancy right but look out for classical things so pain which is migrating uh, right or associated with fever nausea vomiting right leukocytosis as i said is physiological so not a very reliable factor in pregnancy right okay next question your patient undergoes a laparotomy because of a pelvic mass uh, you see a unilateral ovarian neoplasm which is accompanied by large mental metastasis frozen section confirms that it is a serous cyst adenocarcinoma you know this is typical neat pattern wherein the big clinical questions they already give you the diagnosis but rather ask you something else so all the time you are thinking of diagnosis but in the last line they'll give you the diagnosis so what is the most uh, uh, appropriate intraoperative course of action so this is the most common cancer right serious a serous cyst adenocarcinoma right so what you need to do is option b you need to do a total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo ophorectomy with omentectomy yes omentectomy is a routine procedure along with do this we will do a, a, you know a pelvic and para aortic lymph node sampling right so this is a standard procedure that we do for uh, serous cyst adenocarcinomas or ovarian malignancies um we never do cystectomies for ovarian malignancy uh, we do not do unilateral ophorectomies we have to do a bilateral salpingo ophorectomy okay and we have to remove the uterus so that is why option c is also wrong right let's go on to the next question your patient is 17 year old woman she has come uh, because of primary amenorrhea now the patient has evidence of virilization she also has a pelvic mass and during the workup she has a mosaic pattern or she has mosaicism in her karyotype what is the most likely tumor in the patient so if you see look at this this goes in favor of gonadal dysgenesis yes and 
which malignancy or rather i would first ask you which tumor is likely to happen in gonadal dysgenesis it is a gonadoblastoma so most common tumor to happen in gonadal dysgenesis is gonadoblastoma there is the most common cancer is this germinoma and that is why in fact we say a lot of times a this germinoma arises in a gonadoblastoma yes and the other thing which goes in favor of the diagnosis is virilization so yes gonadoblastomas can cause virilization as well so please remember women with gonadal dysgenesis are likely to have uh, malignancies in these gonadal tissues the most common tumor being gonadoblastoma right okay should these patients undergo a uh, gonadectomy yes so please remember this this is why we say whenever you have a female phenotype yes and there is a y chromosome in the karyotype then these patients must undergo gonadectomy because of the high risk of developing malignancies this is the reason why they should undergo gonadectomy okay your patient presents for her first pap smear she's been sexually active right she's 22 years old right now and her pap smear result is high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion which of the following is the most appropriate next step so i do understand that the patient here is less than 25 years but what you have to take care is that once the report is etcel the age of the patient is no longer a criteria to decide on the management once it is etcel she has to undergo a colposcopy and directed biopsy in fact we would also do a endocervical curettage when it's etcel had it been elcel and the patient was less than 25 years then instead of doing a colpo biopsy we would do a repeat pap at 1 year but once even for ascus you know if she is less than 25 and the report is ascus Uh, then again yes you can do a repeat pap smear but once it is high grade uh, you know uh, intraepithelial lesion you will have to do a colpo biopsy okay now in a neonoric patient who has had a pituitary ablation for a craniopharyngeoma what do you want to give her to bring about a ovulatory cycle now please remember Once you say she's undergone a pituitary ablation, it means the pituitary is no longer going to function. So what do you not have? You do not have LH and FSH, right? So please remember there is no point in giving her GnRH because this will not be able to have any action on the pituitary. Clomiphene citrate again, the action or site of action is pituitary. So pituitary here is damaged. So CC will not act. Now. can you give her only human menopausal or recombinant gonadotropin right if you give her hmg alone or uh, you know recombinant fsh alone then it will cause follicular growth but there is no lh also you have to bring about a rupture of the follicle and the process of ovulation so what you need to do is a complete treatment which is going to be recombinant gonadotropins followed by hcg to bring about the process of ovulation yes so the answer here is d this number 21 so she is a 18 year old girl and ovarian tumor with raised ldh and the histopath finding has been given so you don't actually need the histopath finding age group is more likely to have germ cell tumors raised ldh goes in favor of a dis germy noma right so that's the answer here and what do you see you see sheets of cells separated by fibrous septae which have lymphocytic infiltration right please remember the main tumor marker is ldh but it can also have raised hcg and raised plap right and it is the uh, female counterpart for seminoma right now please remember that uh, the most common germ cell tumor of the ovary is dermoid or a mature cystic teratoma whereas the most common germ cell cancer of the ovary is immature teratoma right followed by dis germy noma okay let's look at this now the instrument shown is used in which of the following so the answer is all the above so yes this is a carmen scanula yes and uh 
Carmen's cannula in an incomplete abortion would be used to complete the process of abortion by suction evacuation. Endometrial biopsy or a EAC, endometrial aspiration cytology, we all know we use Carmen's cannula in the OPD. Yes, it can also be used to retrieve the missing IUD. You know, these ends, hooked ends can be used to, uh, the openings can be used to hook the IUD. Also, the cannula with the suction pressure can be actually used to retrieve the missing IUD. Okay. Let's look at this. So, she is a lady with heavy menstrual bleeding for past six months. And the following is the ultrasound image. So, this is a submucous fibroid. And what category submucous fibroid? It is a grade 1, right, where more than 50% is intracavitary. Right. So, this is a, a submucosal fibroid and the treatment of choice for submucosal fibroids causing menorrhagia is hysteroscopic myomectomy. Right. So, that is the treatment of choice for submucosal fibroids causing menorrhagia. So, the answer here will be C. The following is the HSG image on a, of a woman being evaluated for recurrent abortions. So, you see that this angle between the two horns is wide. Uh, the gap between the two horns is also quite wide. So, this is going to be more likely be a biconvate uterus. Yes, I know the moment we say recurrent abortions, you think of septate. But please remember, the other Mullerian anomalies can also present as recurrent abortions. The most common one is septate. That's because septate uterus in general is the most common Mullerian anomaly. Whereas, uh, biconvate is the second most common Mullerian anomaly. And yes, biconvate can also cause recurrent abortions. Although it can cause preterm labor, it can cause malpresentations, it can cause IUGR as well. Yes, so if on HSG the angle looks wide, more than 60 degrees, and if the distance between the two horns is more than 4 centimeters, then it is more likely to be, we'll confirm it by a 3D ultrasound, but it is more likely to be a biconvate uterus. Okay. Your patient complains of foul smelling discharge. The moment we say foul smelling discharge, we either think of bacterial vaginosis or we think of trichomonas, right? But there is no pruritus and there are no urinary complaints. So therefore goes more in favor of bacterial vaginosis. The saline microscopy is also showing us clue cells, yes, which are bacteria laden cells, uh, uh, epithelial cells. So now we know that the diagnosis is bacterial vaginosis. Yes, uh, please remember it is not a STD and therefore her partner does not need to be treated. She does not need any treatment as the discharge is physiological? No. It is a foul smelling discharge, yes, uh, and you are documenting clue cells as well. So this is not a physiological discharge. Uh, she needs treatment with tab natural and resolve for seven days. That's the answer here. Uh, needs culture of the discharge to decide further treatment. This is also wrong. Please remember, culture of the discharge is of no value in bacterial vaginosis. If there is any doubt in the diagnosis, then what you can do is gram stain, where we will look for Nugent score. Yes, so a Nugent score between 7 to 10 confirms bacterial vaginosis. Okay, and the pH of vagina is again important. It's going to be more than 4.5. The color of the discharge is off-white or gray. Okay, now a baby is born with isolated deformity shown in the image. Isolated means there is no other congenital deformity or malformation. The pregnancy may have been complicated by which of the following? The answer is A, oligohydramnios. Let's see why. What is this? This is CTEV. Yes, and this is, uh, as you know, it is a compression defect. So when there is less space and the gravid uterus is compressing on the baby, the limbs, uh, you know, assume abnormal positions and remain like that and develop contractures. So CTV is because of a compression defect, right? And why would there be compression? Because there is less lica. Similar thing you see with Potter's syndrome. Yes, in Potter's syndrome also there is severe oligo. And because of this, the baby develops pulmonary hypoplasia. The baby develops limb defects like uh, CTEV and will develop characteristic facial features, which is again because of compression, compressed facial features. 
uh, right? And in Potter's, the oligo is because of renal pathology, like a multicystic kidney. Yes, so similar things you can see with Potter's as well. Okay, not true about the device shown below. So this is a Mirena. You all know this is a progesterone releasing device and therefore it reduces the risk of PID. So progesterone is going to make the mucus thicker. May cause amenorrhea? Yes, because again, so these are correct options. Uh, not true, but I the true me batari. It can cause amenorrhea because it causes thinning of the endometrium. So because of continuous exposure to progesterone, the endometrium gets thinned up. Contraindicated in women with breast cancer. Yes, we have discussed this before. It's contraindicated in women with breast cancer. Now, the answer here is A. Uh, it is not to be replaced every 7 years. It is to be replaced every 5 years. Although, yes, the drug may be erratically released after 5 years up to 7 years, but the contraceptive efficacy is not there. Right? So, replaced every 5 years. Failure rate, I hope you remember, is 0.1 to 0.2%. Okay, identify the type of placenta previa. So this is going to be a type 3 placenta previa where uh, placenta partially covers the internal os, right? Uh, although uh, this classification is no longer used, but you should know. Now there is only one classification. Either you say placenta previa or you say a low-lying placenta. Low-lying is same as type 1. That means the placenta should be within 2 centimeters of internal os. Everything else is put under the category of placenta previa. Okay. Gestational trophoblastic uh, neoplasia does not include. So the answer is partial mole. We all know it includes invasive mole, it includes choriocarcinoma, it includes PSTT and it includes ETT, epithelioid trophoblastic tumor. The most common among these is invasive mole. The second most common among these is choriocarcinoma, right? Also, please remember uh, the most common GTN, right, after a full-term pregnancy is choriocarcinoma, right? So, remember this. In general, the most common GTN is invasive mole. But the most common GTN after full-term pregnancy is choriocarcinoma, although it is Less likely to happen, but if it develops after full term, it will be a choriocarcinoma, right? So all the following are physiological changes in pregnancy, except the best answer here is increased residual volume. So yes, residual volumes, reserve volumes, they all are going to decrease. Yes, not increase. GFR, we know, increases by 50%. So therefore, the serum creat levels are going to decrease. Cardiac output, we all know, increases in pregnancy. Yes, the total protein production increases. So the total uh, body albumin and the globulin levels increase, but the serum albumin levels are going to decrease. And please remember, as far as serum globulin is concerned, it may be increased, right? So total protein production by the liver is increasing. So total body protein increases, but the serum albumin levels are low. This is because of hemodilution. So this is because of lot of water retention, right? So serum albumin will definitely be low. The globulins may show a increase, okay?